All right. Hello and good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second Live Right webinar series of 2024. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Anisha Vige, and I will be the moderator and host of the session, as well as sharing some of my nutrition expertise as a dietitian later on during the panel discussion. So the Canadian Liver Foundation National Office is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabewaki, Haudenosaunee, Mississauga, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We acknowledge and extend our gratitude and respect to all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people for their valuable contributions. Non-Indigenous people have been an important role as we work towards reconciliation and the more actions that we can take and speak up about in solidarity with Indigenous peoples, the more that we can create lasting change for future generations. So before we dive into our agenda, I would like to let everyone know that the CLF has rebranded our webinars to the new Live Right brand, encompassing more of our support and education services. If you have attended any of our previous webinar sessions last year, you may remember these under our Living with Liver Disease brand. But even with this new name, our educational services are the same and have been around for more than 25 years and continue to serve as a supportive educational tool for both patients and caregivers, as well as those looking to learn more about liver health. This program provides an opportunity to increase community-based support, learning about liver disease, and the importance of liver health in the hopes to reduce the incidence and impact of liver disease through prevention, early diagnosis, treatment, and care without geographical barriers. So some of our speakers throughout these webinars include healthcare providers like we have today, allied health professionals, subject matter experts, as well as patient advocates. So today's session will address affordable nutrition for managing and preventing liver disease, including some budget-friendly tips and tricks. We are joined by our speaker today, Dr. Diana Major from the University of Alberta, and she will give her talk and then we will move on to a panel discussion and wrap up with a Q&A. Please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen, as you can see on the slides, uh, to ask any questions during the presentation, but please note that questions will be answered following the presentation and panel discussion. Today's session will be recorded and available on the Canadian Liver Foundation's resource hub on our website, as well as our YouTube channel and Facebook page in the coming days. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Canadian Liver Foundation, the CLF was established in 1969 and was the first organization in the world created to help people specifically with liver disease. The CLF is committed to promoting liver health and improving the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of liver disease through our four core pillars of research, education, patient support, and advocacy. At this time, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Diana Major. Dr. Major is an Associate Professor in Clinical Nutrition at the Department of Agricultural Food Nutrition Science at the University of Alberta. Her research focuses on treatment strategies, including nutrition support interventions in chronic liver disease in both children and adults, as well as lifestyle modification, patient outcomes, and evidence-based clinical diet and nutrition practices. Dr. Major, over to you. Thank you so much. And first, I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Alberta um, holdings are primarily located on the traditional territories of territories six and seven, which are constituents of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and Ojibwe, um, Soto, and Ashkena uh, sorry, Ash Ashitanabe nations, lands that are known as part of treaties six and seven. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen now. So today um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to eat a nutrition, nutritious and affordable diet. I'm going to what's in nutrients and healthy for maintaining your liver health. And then I'm going to go on to really focus on one of the most hot topics that even our government thinks is a hot topic is how expensive food is in Canada and other parts of the world and what can we do to what are some tips that we can do to address uh, those issues so as you know Canada's food guide uh, came out with a new uh, plate in 2019 and there are a lot of really good things about this plate for example there's an emphasis on consuming plant-based proteins fruits and vegetables whole grains, and making water the drink of choice. So this is really important because there's lots of evidence, for example, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 
that fruits and vegetables have lots of antioxidants in them, for example, which are very helpful for the liver for prevention of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if you do have that in terms of trying to promote optimizing liver function. And the other thing that the Canada's Food Guide really, really focuses on is meal preparation, which will come in handy about what I'm going to talk about today. And with a strong emphasis of the family involvement, and on global cuisines, because Canada is a country of, of ethnic diversity, and it's really important to think about how can we eat a healthy diet for uh, liver health, but at the same time, make recommendations that are about foods that people in Canada truly do eat. So one of the basic important messages about following a healthy diet is to focus on maintaining body weights in a healthy weight range to ensure that the diet provides enough micronutrients, but also protein is very, very important in terms of maintaining lean body mass. And this is particularly important for adults and children who have liver disease because they have an increased loss of lean body mass. And so it's very important to focus on, you know, plant-based sources of protein and to optimize protein intake. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what, I'm, what I mean by optimizing. But you saw on the plate previously that a quarter of the plate was full of, of um, plant-based proteins as well, along with if you eat an animal-based proteins uh, 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 that as well. So lean cuts of meat, lower fats, cuts of meat. And those are really important for maintenance of liver health. And you really do need to consider what stage of liver disease you are in. In the very early stages of liver disease, focusing on micronutrient intake, and antioxidants and also following Canada's food guide is really important to promoting um, the the or minimizing the progression of liver disease. When you're in the further stages of liver disease, there are other uh, things that also on top of protein that become important. But for example, being careful of how much sodium you consume. The other thing that's really important was that plate full of fruit and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables and whole grains are really important in, in terms of giving your body the energy it needs. But I really am not meaning about like from a fruit point of view, sugary drinks. For example, sugary drinks can be full of fruit drinks, can be full of high fructose corn syrup. And that's been shown to be a, a a factor that plays a role in the progression and onset of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we, what we're really talking about is fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains in terms of the emphasis. It can also be cooked or frozen vegetables, for example, too, but, but not the kind of fruit that you would find in fast foods or in sugary drinks. So it's really important to minimize the amount of sugar sweetened beverages and processed foods that an individual eats. It's it's fine to have, you know, fruit juice every once in a while. A four ounce fruit juice, you know, a few times a week is OK. But as you can see, Canada's Food Guide is really recommending water at each meal instead of a fruit juice. So if you love the taste of, of sweet vegetables or sweet fruits, then we're recommending that you eat a whole piece of fruit or a cooked or frozen uh, fruit or vegetable. So it's very important not to really consume adults more than uh, eight ounces per week of sugar sweetened beverages and when you already have like a liver disease such as NAPLD, we recommend generally speaking to, to limit it no, to no more than four ounces a week. And that the, also the recommendations are children, for example, under two should avoid fruit juices um, in general. The evidence for like, for example, routine supplementation, because that's one of the biggest questions is, well, should I take a special vitamin supplement to make my liver healthier? If you eat from all four food groups, you should in the... To, for liver health, you shouldn't really need to take a multivitamin. Um, what one vitamin that might be the exception is vitamin D. Uh, I'm in Alberta and it's snowing today. So the amount of sunlight exposure that's going to make vitamin D on my skin right now is nil. But even in the summer in the northern climates of Canada, from Toronto to Edmonton to further north, Although we do produce vitamin D on our skin, it's hard to play catch up in terms of getting optimal vitamin D status. So that is the one nutrient that may be really, really important for supplementation for to promote optimal liver health. And certainly if you already have a liver disease and have any signs of jaundice or with cirrhosis, it might be necessarily for you to take a vitamin supplement for vitamins A, D, E, and K.
And that can be because when you have uh, a jaundice, you have what's called the condition of cholestasis, where you may not have optimal fat-soluble vitamin absorption. And so it might be helpful to take a supplement with those. However, in the early stages of liver disease or for pre prevention, vitamin A, and for example, can be found in orangey yellow vegetables, tomato sauce, tomatoes. You can find um, E and K, for example, in green leafy vegetables, which, which is again on the Canada's Food Guide plate. And then vitamin E, you can also get in nuts and seeds. Those are great sources as well. So it is possible to promote liver health by eating a wide variety of foods to uh, without the need for supplementation to promote optimal liver health. And I just wanted to show here that from a food supply point of view, there are, a, there are some vitamin D sources that can be found in the diet. The most common one are plant-based beverages that have been fortified with vitamin D or cow's milk that's been routinely uh, fortified with vitamin D. You can find a little bit of vitamin D in egg yolk. And then, of course, in fatty fishes, uh, salmon, for example, you can get quite a bit of vitamin D from that. Breakfast cereals are often fortified with, with vitamin D. And then in vitamin D, fortified yogurts. Not all yogurts are fortified with vitamin D. It's the pediatric ones are typically, but um, not all adult preparations of yogurt are. A little bit in cheese as well. Now, you see the picture juice here. There are vitamin D fortified juices. But again, the point about uh, drinking juice, about limiting to what I suggested in the earlier slides, means basically that by the, the juice will not be the best source in the diet of vitamin D. Probably most people will get their most in the diet from plant-based beverages or cow's milk, and then they may still need a supplement as well. You can find a little bit in mushrooms, certain types of mushrooms as well. And so um, that also is an option in the diet to help you meet your vitamin D needs. In terms of liver health, Everyone talks about the Mediterranean food pyramid. And really, you can see on the bottom of the pyramid, lots of fruits and vegetables here on the bottom, um, recommending lean cuts of meat, uh, fish, uh, a strong focus on fish, and less focus on foods that, that are higher in saturated fats, such as eggs, cheese, dairy products, meats, and so forth. And on the side, you can see there is what the French call the French paradox, wine. And the reason people uh, put wine on the side is that extra um, wine can be very high in polyphenols, which are antioxidants. Do I recommend wine for optimal liver health? No. Um, in fact, you can get lots of polyphenols that's in that cup of wine in uh, blueberries, walnuts, cranberries, and other berries, spinach, green tea, and also cooking with extra virgin olive oil. And there's quite a bit of emphasis on cooking with extra virgin olive oils and adding berries and so forth to your diet. You can add berries to breakfast cereal, you can add um, berries to salads along with walnuts and have yourself a really nice garden salad. And there is a spinach to your dinner or have a spinach salad mixed with berries berries and they're very tasty in order to get your antioxidant. And that's probably from a liver point of view, the healthiest way to get those polyphenols. And then of course, you can see that omega-3 fatty acids in those fatty fishes that we were talking about before that are great for vitamin D, they're also full of omega-3 fatty acids, which are known to be anti-inflammatory for the body. And the liver really likes um, anti-inflammatory fatty acids in terms of that lowers the risk for storage of fat in the liver. And then, of course, we really, th this diet also emphasizes a lower saturated fat intake. And that's why cheese is put a little bit higher on the list of what to to minimize in the diet. So as you go up that triangle, it means as you get to the narrow, narrow part of the apex, you want to eat less and less of those foods. And so cheese is uh, is fine to eat sometimes, but it is high in saturated fatty acid. And so we want to minimize how often uh, we eat cheese. There are some lower fat cheeses, which will have a little bit less saturated fat, fatty acids in them. So if you do like cheese, that's one option to consider. 
And so this kind of tool or the Mediterranean food pyramid is really important to give you some sense about what kinds of nutrients to focus on. And it's very similar in some ways to Canada's food guide. Again, half that plate is full of a lot of these foods you see in the lowest part of the triangle here. So some of the things that we need to think about for eating healthy is the high cost of food that's really been occurring across globally because of the ongoing global conflicts, the COVID-19 effect, affected food, climate change in Alberta is a topic of, of you know, that's really hot topic. And so a lot of families across Canada are facing uh, um, problems with access to affordable and, and nutrition, nutritious food supply. And living in the north with the food supply chain issues that have been occurring with many uh, fresh produce, that can be really challenging to eat a diet that's optimal for liver health. And so I think it is important to talk about that because about 20% of Canadians, 20 to 25% of Canadians do live in households that experience some level of food insecurity. So sometimes that's about uh, having problems with making decisions about, should I pay my rent? Should I, uh, if I don't have a drug plan, should I pay for my meds? Or should I uh, focus my food expenditures on like my, my budget on food expenditures? Alberta, for example, last year had the highest rate of food insecurity insecurity across the provinces. And the most recent data says it's still in the top two. And so it, this is a big issue because we, we want to recommend that, that the data shows eating fresh pr produce and minimally processed foods are really important, but the price of those foods have outpaced even the increases in foods that are processed or ultra processed foods. So even though when you go to your local fast food outlet, the food prices have gone up there. They haven't gone up as much as the food prices of the fresh fruits and vegetables that we're recommending as Canadians are good for the liver. And so some of the things across Canada that have been looked at that have been factors that affect food insecurity, um, I'm not going to name them all, but definitely there is a big issue in the north and in remote communities. And that might be why Alberta is one of the highest provinces. We have a large amount of our population living in remote communities. Employment status, income is one of the biggest ones. Single parent households are really important. We still really don't understand all of the factors that affect food insecurity for adults and children uh, with liver disease. But we do know that these are similar factors that across Canada are important. And certainly you know, it can be very challenging because there's data to show that food insecurity can, can result in low diet quality. And again, that ties into the fact that processed foods, the increases in prices of those haven't gone up as quickly as the increase in prices of foods that are um, minimally processed or fresh produce. And so I'm just again showing you this, there's a, re a recent report that shows you the increases in prices or the forecast. And overall, we can see that if you look onto the right, in 2023, the cost of vegetables, for example, across Canada went up by about almost 8%. And it's one of the highest categories, yet that, those are the foods we're recommending for liver health because they're full of antioxidants. And in 2024, there's again some forecasts that suggest that vegetables will be one of the highest categories for, for food price increases. Although they are forecasting that food price, the, the inflationary indices of food prices going up will be lower than what was experienced in Canada in 2023. So the 2024 are right now food price forecasts. And again, if you look by province and it, right now on what the data is re reported, Alberta, for example, is expected to see Ontario and right across the board the the food prices are expected to increase in a majority of the provinces. There are some provinces, uh, for example, that are forecasted not to see giant increases in food costs, but the majority will see food price increases of up to 6% or 7%. Still issue and so some of that you know in terms of okay so i've listed what's good for the liver we've talked a little bit about the challenges of, uh, in terms of food costs and food access how how that's problematic now we need to give some suggestions about 
Like, what can you do to eat a healthy diet when you are facing these issues? So a lot of the very basic focus can be surrounding about meal planning. So it's really important to avoid uh, impulse buying in the grocery stores and so and good to think about and plan ahead if you can uh, your meal list or the food list of what you want to buy because then you can make a, a grocery list of foods you can look for in-store deals sometimes you can buy in bulk um, especially frozen or stored ones and sometimes grocery stores have their own line that's you know like a no frills or that may be a little bit uh cheaper and so um you could stock up when they have in store uh store deals because they can um be uh, you know two to five percent cheaper and that kind of covers off some of that inflationary increases you can you definitely do need to compare unit prices and brands to get the lowest price um so um that's one strategy walking into using your phone your smartphone and having a grocery list already prepared look at the coupons when you walk into the store i used to totally ignore those and now i'm very obsessed by looking at them because you, often you can save quite a bit of money there are a bunch of apps like i have not used these specific apps but i i do hear that these are apps that are very usable they can provide you with online uh coupons you can get you can get the app to send you alerts and notification when a food item goes on sale from the grocery stores. And it helps you compare weekly flyers of different grocery stores to find the best deal. And so all of those can be really, really helpful um, to meal planning ahead and help you stay on a budget because then they, these meal, some of these apps can actually help you calculate the total of what you might spend on your your grocery bill so if you sh shop once a week using these and planning ahead are really really useful and then I think it's important to think about like food storage and looking at food expiration dates when you purchase your grocery items because you don't want to buy food where the expiry dates in a day or two and not use it uh, and in contrast you know thinking about storage of shelf stable foods it do keep a little bit longer that maybe it's okay to buy a bit more of those because if they are on your counter in a cool dry place you know you don't have to worry about having to eat them all in the beginning so like apples oranges potatoes you can store those for quite a bit of time carrots as well so I think it's important to think about um, that when you're buying foods but if you're buying like foods that will expire quickly then maybe the volume of those you don't want to buy as many of those frozen foods are a great way um, you, you need to consider that if your freezer should be around minus 18 half the time I wouldn't even need a freezer outside in my house in Edmonton and half the time between November and the end of March it is minus 18 outside so but um, it's important to think about that and then maybe thinking about your fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, thinking about frozen, freezing them. You can make them into jams or spread, or you could chop up some of the vegetables like carrots and put them in the freezer. Um, dried fruits also have a longer storage life. They are more expensive to purchase in the store, but they're fairly easy to, to um, dry uh, at a low temperature in your oven. There's lots of tips on how to do that and um, putting them on a sheet and you can dry them yourself as well. And so when you do it yourself, um, it can it it can be a lot less expensive than purchasing dried fruits uh, in the store. And then of course, you know, in terms of the food prices, fresh produce, if it is particularly if it's out of season, is always going to be more expensive than frozen and canned. And I know we like to shy away from canned uh, vegetables and fruits. And, and so sodium is an issue in the uh, canned foods. But if you, I'm going to show you a food label in some subsequent slides. And if you look for uh, on the food label and you look to see if the percent daily value is less than 5%, you'll know it's a low source of sodium. It's true, frozen would have less sodium in it, and that's something to consider. But both can be really good options, particularly when it's winter time and uh, you know the the out of season fruits and vegetables are very expensive. And so they can be frozen uh, fruits and vegetables can be actually quite tasty as well. So you need to read the food labels just to to see which is the healthier choice. And here's on this label, I'm just 
trying to show you here, there is a, food, a nutrition facts table that, and you look at the, the column where it says percent daily value or percent DV. And so for example, the total fat of, or the percent DV of total fat means that this is a higher source of fat compared to maybe another food label that's less than 5%. So things that say 5% of the DV, so here the saturated fat says 5% of the DV, that means that for that nutrient, saturated fat, it, it's a poor source of that specific nutrient. So you're looking for sodium to be as low as possible. So I've pointed here, it's 7%. It's, it's between that five and 10%, which is not a low source of sodium, but it's also not considered a high source of sodium. So if you had to choose two cans of, of uh, so let's say canned uh, corn or canned peas, and one said 9% DV for sodium, and one said 7%, then choose the one with the lower DV of sodium. And if it's less than 5%, you'll know it's a low source of sodium or a lower source of foam. In contrast, it's sometimes good when the percent DV is higher than 10% or higher than 15%, if, for example, it were to be vitamin D or calcium or even iron. And you can see for this particular food label down here, the iron is an excellent source of iron. So uh, in the diet for this particular uh, food item. And the potassium is an okay source. Potassium is great for a person. It's healthy, uh, particularly in uh, whole foods and fresh and, and frozen foods, but this one is not a bad source. It's certainly not a low source. So look for lower values at 5% or less for things like sodium or saturated fat or fat and cholesterol, for example. And when it comes to micronutrients like vitamin D or iron or calcium, if you had a percent DV that's higher than 10%, uh, that would be a good thing. And then also looking at the ingredients list. So the nutrition facts table here also has an ingredient list as well of different types of foods. And so you want to, uh, if especially if this is gonna be a fruit juice or a jam, or um, other pro processed foods, you wanna look uh, at some of the words on the food label because you're looking for the word um, high fructose corn syrup. You wanna avoid consuming uh, canned good items that have high fructose corn syrup or extra sugar. And you usually can tell that from the first ingredient or the second ingredient. And don't be fooled by the word cane sugar. Cane sugar, sugar is sugar. And so if that's on the first two uh, ingredient listing, then that's a high source of those type of, of ingredients and you wanna avoid that. Just like with the word sea salt, a lot of people think if you buy sea salt, it sounds so breezy, like if you buy the beach in Vancouver, uh, but salt is salt. And, uh, and so if that's the first ingredient, that would be a higher sodium uh, containing food item than something else that had salt listed as the third to fourth ingredient. Still, both of them could have salt, but then you'd go back to the percent DV to see, is that less than 5% or more than 5%? And then again, reading these kind of ingredient lists here. So here you can see there's raisins coated with vegetable oil, whole grain, whole wheat flour, including the germ, cinnamon flakes, but sugar is listed much lower in the ingredient list here. It says sugar, modified palm, and palm kernel oil. So the sugar, the first time you really see a, a, a sugar containing ingredients is like down at number four. So it's going to be a little bit lower, but here I'm seeing the word sugar, glucose, and fructose. So it doesn't say high fructose corn syrup. So again, this label is not um, a, a terrible label for the type of food that it is. If the raisins said coat it with sugar as, as ingredient list number three or four, then I would be more skeptical about this particular ingredient list. And I wanna make sure that everyone walks away with the idea that high fructose corn syrup is, is not the same kind of fructose as you find in a whole piece of fruit. Or, for example, fruit has fructose, but it's not processed fructose. High fructose corn syrup is, is processed fructose that has extra molecules on it that stimulate fat synthesis. And so that's why they're not that healthy for the liver, but fruits and vegetables, fruits with fructose, you shouldn't try to limit 
that the naturally occurring fructose that occurs in fruits and vegetables. And again, in terms of thinking about, you know, eating on a budget, choosing fresh produce that's in season is a great idea. But again, we're in the middle of winter here and hardly anything is in season in Alberta right now. Uh, so for from a protein point of view, focusing on dried pulses like beans, dry peas, lentils, chickpeas, um, eating root vegetables, for example, like carrots that have longer storage time, whether they're frozen. I would go to the frozen um, a section of the grocery store to look for frozen vegetables and frozen uh, fruit during the time when th that those foods are not in season. Now you can buy larger volumes of milk or plant beverages. That they're often cheaper than if you buy small containers, but the thing about that is storage then, right? So you have to weigh the balance of the size of your family, uh, how you're gonna store it, um, freezing milk is possible and then maybe using in cooking later as well uh, is an option to consider. Plant-based beverages freeze a little bit better than um, milk do and it's very important to compare the price of the fresh versus the shelf-stable milk alternatives to get the best price when you're at the grocery store. So it's not only just in the grocery store or making a list that you can you can really deal or eat a healthy diet. Um, even just thinking about like, what did I cook last, last night? How much leftovers do I have from the previous night dinner? Because dinner can be eaten the next day for lunch, for example. Maybe you made a chili or maybe you um, had a chicken casserole. You can make a wrap out of that for, um, out of, out of, out of last night's dinner, well, you can take a beef stew or a veg, a vegetarian based chili and put, wrap it in with some lettuce or put it in a pita wrap. You can add some shredded cheese to, add, to put that on top. And that's a very cost effective lunch. It helps you avoid wasting food quite a bit because you're reusing. And it also makes it easier not to have to worry about when you get up in the morning for your kids' lunches or for your own lunches, what are you gonna make? Because you can go straight to your refrigerator and take part of last night's dinner. And there's nothing to say you couldn't eat that for breakfast too. Maybe you'll skip the cheese in that wrap and you'll add a, um, a little bit of salsa sauce instead of the cheese to give the wrap a different flavor. So really anything that's a stir fry, leftover veggies, a stew or a soup can be uh, either wrapped up in lettuce or in um, a pita bread or in pita wraps and, and be consumed later on the next day. You can take the vegetables from last night's uh, beef stew and you can make use part of that as a, a stir fry um, the next night for dinner as well too. Too. And, and that helps you make a cost effective meal and to minimize food wastage. And I think that's really important. And to think about being creative and trying something different. Sometimes just putting a different sauce on something really changes the taste of the meal and doesn't really add anything to your grocery bill. You can eat vegetables that maybe your kids or you haven't tried recently um, and and uh, encourage them to eat. My family, I, I had a hard time getting them to eat kale, but now my family love kale chips. You put some kale on, on a tray in the oven, you put a little bit of olive oil, a tiny little bit, and it makes it crispy. And now my kids eat, eat uh, kale. Um, so the, And then you save money because kale is a fairly low cost vegetable. It's full of micronutrients. It's healthy for your liver, but it, it, you give it that crunchy taste. And sometimes changing the texture of things really does help you eat a healthier diet and eat the healthy type of fat that you're looking for in that Mediterranean um, meal pattern. And then you can think of other substitutions. These are just some lists. For example, if you don't have any rice because you haven't purchased it. Maybe some quinoa or spaghetti noodles could be made for your stir fry. Or, you know, um, if you don't have any beef or a recipe, maybe I'll choose chicken or beans or kidney beans or black beans or chickpeas. Um, it's really important about just trying to be creative when you're when you've got different food ingredients and you you want to whip something up you you got home late that night and you don't have a lot of time to spend cooking and so really just being creative using canned mushrooms again is okay you can drain the excess fluid just rinse it out warm to get some less residue off 
throw that into a stir fry. Um, if you don't have a bottle of stir fry sauce, then you could use, you know, fresh garlic or garlic powder, fresh ginger, uh, and make your own little sauce at the same time. And it really doesn't take uh, uh, too much time because I know what it's like. Um, I have kids um, and I need to think ahead of what I'm doing with them and what their lunches are going to be about. They, they're they actually old enough now to make their own lunch and sometimes I'm lucky when they make mine too. So, And it's about being creative, about throwing different ingredients together. And that can really minimize food wastage, really make meals, switch them up to make them taste good and give you different options to try uh, without having to go out and buy specialty food ingredients where the, where the grocery bill can go up quite a bit. And then I've always said that a grocery store is really a place of learning. Right from the start, um, I've always recommended to families that they take their children with them to the grocery store, let them be part of the meal, the food preparation, be part of looking at different cereals, you know, and having a discussion about why some are better or, or healthier, why some can taste, why you can turn the taste into one to be more fun and more zesty by really taking your child to the grocery store and letting them see a whole variety of different foods. And I think it's really important to have participation of the family, not just one person making the decision about meal prep or uh, food purchases, because really then you can try different kind of ideas. And lots of people tell me, or kids will tell me, I don't like fruits or I don't like vegetables. Sometimes you buy their favorite yogurt, you make a shake and you mix those uh, vegetables or fruits into a shake and then that can turn things around quite a bit in terms of taste and encouraging kids to get more fruits and vegetables in their diet that way too because it doesn't have to be solid food it can be in a beverage that that you whip up in a blender with yogurt based um, or water based and you can get a, there's a lot of really fun shakes out there that have bananas spinach kale in them that are, are really tasty and so part of that is about making family family having the family involved in food preparation and in grocery shopping so that you can promote optimal liver health and so that's that's the end of my presentation uh, so i just always acknowledge my whole group and the interdisciplinary teams that I work with um, in the Story Children's Hospital at the University of Alberta as well, because they have all, they, um, the families really share with us in clinic, what are some of their challenges in meeting the nutritional requirements for their children? Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for that excellent, excellent talk. Uh, I'm hoping that that gives people lots of insights. So I think we're going to jump into our panel discussion. Uh, so my first question for you, Diana, is uh, this person lives in a rural area and groceries are really expensive, uh, even canned and frozen. What do you recommend? So like a couple of things you can think about doing, it, food is cheaper when you buy it in bulk, for example. So sometimes neighbors will go into the most local town and buy things in bulk and they'll share it among the families. So that could be one way, buying, purchasing in bulk and in season. But the other thing to consider, even in a climate like Alberta, where it's cold most of the year, about growing foods in your garden like you can save a lot of money like by growing herbs even if you live in a condo in Toronto my daughter's studying in Toronto lives in a condo and she grows herbs on the balcony in in, in Toronto even in the winter and so you can grow some of your own uh, food, uh, you know, even like tomatoes, herbs, spices, and save a lot of money. You do have to consider like how much sunlight exposure some of these herbs like, um, and some don't like a lot, some do. The condos have all sorts of fancy rules about how much you can do. You can also, as I mentioned, dry fruits. Um, you can dry them, berries um, and other fruits, you can dry them in your oven yourself because they can be stored for a much longer time. And then, of course, you can freeze your own fruits and vegetables that you when you buy them when you when 
um, they are in season so that you can store things. Uh, jams are a great way to uh, store um, um, and, uh, and blenderize uh, berries and strawberries and so forth. So uh, there are a variety of things, but I think one of the common ones that are used here is kind of like bulk buying when it's in season to save a lot of money and then freezing uh, as they go along um, when they purchase it in the summer months so that they have like a, a, a backup during those cold winter months when canned and frozen are, are expensive. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know that that can definitely be a big money saver uh, no matter where you live, but I can imagine that is especially true in more rural areas. So the second question I think I can answer, um, how do cultural foods fit into a liver healthy diet if someone maybe doesn't eat a Western diet and maybe eats a more um, culturally diverse diet like someone from India? Um, there are lots of different um, cultures that can easily incorporate liver healthy uh, foods into their diets and the principles of focusing on fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, lean and plant proteins, whole grains, all of those things apply here too. those things that Dr. Major was talking about earlier. Um, some examples when looking at Indian food specifically, you could have dosas, which are often served with uh, chutney and sambar. They're full of plant proteins, fiber, healthy fats. Uh, you can cook with mustard oil or vegetable oil um, or other kind of plant oils instead of maybe cooking as much with ghee that can add in some uh, healthy fats and, and polyphenols like, like we were discussing earlier. Um, are there options that are looking at maybe some more plant-based proteins like chana masala or dal, or if you're looking at meat proteins, you could have tandoori chicken, uh, chicken biryani, um, even adding in different vegetables into things like alu gobi that has some, you know, cauliflower and some potatoes. So it's kind of a two in one that you can get there. Uh, chutneys with lots of, you know, leafy greens that you can use in there, raitas with some protein from the yogurt. Uh, sag paneer, which is a cheese dish, but has lots of spinach and, and can usually be found as a more low, uh, low fat cheese. So higher in protein, lower in fat, great for liver health. Um, all of those things can be really great ways to eat a liver friendly diet while still being able to eat your own culture's foods um, as much as you like, really. So I'll get Dr. Major to answer this one first, but I definitely have some thoughts. Uh, are vitamins and supplements an okay alternative if I don't eat enough healthy foods because they can be cheaper than groceries? Well, whole foods actually have a better assortment or blend of micronutrients and antioxidants than those individual pill bottles. Some of the things you have to consider is the amount that's in that supplement. Um, the the industry is not uniformly regulated in a way that you can be sure that all supplements that are available in the market in Canada uh, have safe levels or not. I mean, most of them are, but um, you really, when you buy a multivitamin, they don't always have all the micronutrients you need to get. And they're certainly missing things like lycopenes and polyphenols that are really anti-inflammatory for um, your liver. So I do, I would say that they're not a substitute for real food at all. Now, if you're talking about other like high protein uh, supplements to, to perhaps if you have a poor uh intake and it's like a milkshake or nutritional supplement so long as you're not replacing it entirely um, in your diet from from food and those definitely are not less expensive than whole foods they're more expensive then they may be helpful if you are having challenges with your appetite the only um vitamin that really uh is important i think from a Canadian, large Canadian perspective, it really is vitamin D and you don't have to take it every day, but vitamin D in the range of a thousand to 2000 IUs a day, taken a few times per week in the winter months uh, are probably a, an important component of a healthy diet. And there's lots of evidence, not only about optimizing bone health, but also evidence in terms of a preventing progression of fibrosis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So there's some evidence for that. And that's a single vitamin 
preparation um, specifically that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a calcium vitamin D combined supplement, um, but otherwise in those, those pill bottles or vitamin supplements um, in the long run, um, you would have to take many different ones of those. There's not a lot on the market that are nutritionally complete of all the things I'm talking about. So in the end, you may not save money anyway. Um, and they don't replace some of those really important phytochemicals that are healthy for the liver and for your heart as well. Absolutely. And the other thing that, you know, is often missing from the multivitamin type supplements is fiber, which is a huge component mm -hmm. of what we need from the fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, things like that, that we're eating, um, you know, for gut health, for satisfaction, for feeling energized and full for a long period of time, you're really not going to get that from um, a multivitamin. You might get it from certain nutrition supplements, like you mentioned, uh, Dr. Major, but again, those are not necessarily cheaper. They can often be very, very expensive and they're great to help with, um, you know, supplementation if you're struggling with appetite or struggling with you know, certain health conditions, they can be really helpful, but they're not a great um, replacement long-term and in bulk for uh, whole foods, like you said. And the availability and the expense are pretty scary right now with some of those, like they're very, uh, you can get them, but they are so expensive, so they won't be cheaper. No, definitely not, <laughs> definitely not. All right. This one is an interesting one that is not always considered. How can a student eat well to prevent liver disease on campus? Um, I can, as a former student myself, uh, not too, too long ago, uh, living on campus and trying to eat well can feel really daunting because you're really limited in what you have on campus a lot of the time, especially if you're living in a dorm where you might not have access to a kitchen to cook your own food, uh, you might not have access to a fridge, and buying food from elsewhere, like restaurants or, or even grocery store, can be out of reach either physically if you're in a more remote campus, or especially for a lot of people financially, if they're already paying for a meal plan, adding additional costs on top of that can be really, really tough. Um, the good thing is many campuses are moving towards healthier options, which is great news for liver and overall health. Um, and focusing on meal options that are plentiful in fruits and veggies, uh, low in fried food, which is sometimes hard to find, um, and containing more lean proteins like plant proteins or even chicken, turkey, lean pork, things like that can be a little bit lower in saturated fats and a little bit better on your liver overall. Um, another option that people might think is maybe tired or maybe even overlooked is the salad bar. Uh, I know that salads don't always sound super interesting, but they can be really filling and fueling if they're well done. And they can really fit into a liver friendly diet if they're well done. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that you're just going to eat lettuce and that's kind of it. Adding in extra vegetables, if there's fruits, um, a carb like sweet potato or corn or quinoa, barley, couscous, even pasta. Often there's pasta salads on salad bars and adding a little bit of pasta, especially if it's a whole grain pasta or a high fiber pasta, can add a little bit of um, carbs and, and kind of help bulk out that salad and feel full and satisfied. Um, even a few croutons if you want a little bit of crunch or some nuts, uh, seeds, and then uh, rounding it out with a nice dressing. There's often a lot of different dressing options, so you can kind of pick which one you want. Going for a vinaigrette type, which is usually an olive oil based rather than a creamy, which is usually like a mayonnaise or um, sometimes even a cream type base can be uh, better for you because the uh, vinaigrette ones that are olive oil based are going to have more of those healthy fats that we were talking about. Um, I do understand that there's limitations of eating on a lot of campuses. So perfection is never the goal, but consistency is the goal. So making even small steps that you can with the you know, resources that you have available to you um, can make a big difference long term on your liver health uh, throughout your educational career. <laughs>
and avoid those vending machines because I, I mean I work on a campus and I see vending machines all the time choose water you know from the vending machine and really go back to, to think about that idea about like taking your lettuce and if you don't like to eat lettuce in a salad you could wrap your hamburger in it for example or your yeah. chick, chicken or whatever um, and it you know instead of maybe that white bun that they might put the hamburger in yeah. and so just just thinking a little bit about all of those ideas and it's not to say you couldn't have the other just maybe once a week you might uh you know flip out that white bun with the high glycemic index for a lettuce or some yeah. other wrap exactly so, the, the small and consistent little changes yeah. that you can make over time yeah so our next question is for you, Dr. Major. Does canned fish have too much mercury and can I still eat it? So something like a canned light tuna is relatively um, low in mercury and it can be eating, but you do have to be careful like of some canned fishes like albacore or yellow fin. People don't usually eat swordfish here, but or big eye tuna are higher in mercury and should be limited or avoided. But you know that light uh, canned tuna, if you have less than twelve ounces of of that canned fish a week, it should be okay. Uh, the one population that maybe I would be a little conservative about consuming that is, you know, women who are who are pregnant or expect to be pregnant in the near future because that could be a concern for the developing fetus but otherwise it is okay uh, to to eat consume um, th uh, canned fish just watch those albacore yellowfin and big eye tuna those are much much higher in mercury than other canned fishes good to know and and things like canned salmon would that be a good choice for a lot of people yep. Yes, and a great source of both vitamin D and those omega-3 fatty acids that they're eating. So, yep, those would be good choices, too. Awesome. I mean, there are really, uh, relatively speaking, affordable protein source. So I know that that's usually a go-to for a lot of people. Yeah. So this one, I think I have some thoughts up, but I, I will let Dr. Major share as well, because I'm sure he has some. Uh, what are cheap, healthy snacks that I can have for liver health? Uh, there's actually a lot of really great cheap, healthy snacks that you can either make or buy, which are liver friendly. Um, if you're looking for kind of a salty, crunchy option, which a lot of people tend to go to for snacks, especially um, air popped popcorn, oven roasted chickpeas, you know, toss them in some of your favorite seasonings. Those can be great on the go snacks. Uh, you can even mix them together and then you get an actually a, a balanced and satisfying snack because you get some carbs, you get some protein and a little bit of those healthy fats. Um, so those can be some great options if you want something crunchy. Um, really, the goal with snacks is to pair usually a carb, a little bit of healthy fats, and a protein source together. So you can do that through um, bean dips like hummus, which can be great for protein, uh, yogurt dips like tzatziki or raita. Eggs are a great option, especially like hard-boiled eggs are really great on the go. Uh, peanut butter can also be an affordable option that has some healthy fats and a little bit of protein in it. Uh, pair that with, you know, an apple or, you know, a banana, whatever your favorite fruit is. Um, one thing with peanut butter is trying to choose uh, peanuts only jars if you can afford them, because that can reduce added saturated fats, which are sometimes added to help kind of keep it all um, in one cohesive substance, if you will. Um, but protein is an important part of a, a snack just to kind of help keep you fueled throughout the day. It can add to uh, your energy levels. It can help with a lot of the different things that your body needs to do. Um, nuts and seeds, like whole nuts and seeds, are great sources of protein and healthy fats as well. Uh, if they're in your budget, they can be a great addition, but sometimes something like a peanut butter or another nut butter or seed butter can sometimes be a little bit more affordable. Um, and then for kind of that carb source that I was talking about, fruits, veggies, whole grain crackers, oatmeal even. Some people forget that oatmeal can be a really great snack and it's usually pretty cheap. Um, whole wheat bread, even if you can get something that's got enough um, fiber in it from that whole wheat with the germ especially is great. Um, they can be accessed pretty cheaply at a lot of stores. So those can be great sources of fiber and carbs um, and paired with the protein can help you feel uh, full and energized for the rest of your day. I mean, for me, I'm obsessed by blueberries, blackberries, cranberries these days yeah. with oatmeal. So um, I'm pretty obsessed by those. I have that or with yogurt, it, um, you know, throw some berries in with a low fat yogurt. 
um, and put it in a container and that's really yummy and I can eat it on the go. And um, so I really like that or spinach, like just some baby spinach with some blueberries thrown in there. Yum. And that, you know, it doesn't go bad while it's in your lunch. It doesn't have to be, you know, keep really cold for a long period of time. So um, I also really like that too, but I mean, it's a, it's a personal choice, but I think all of your suggestions are really, really good. Oatmeal is great as a, a snack. Yeah. I feel like people forget that oatmeal can be an yeah. any time of day snack. It doesn't just have to be for breakfast. Yeah. Totally my, agree. My next question for you is, are microwave meals safe to eat? They can be pretty cheap, but are they safe? So is the microwave itself, like, it, it, like you just have to, so meals, you have to, the microwave me, or microwavable meals, for example, you have to watch the salt content in those. A lot of them have um, higher sodium content in those, but they are safe to eat. When you go to heat them up, you got to be careful of hot spots in the food, right? But again, when we're talking about healthy microwave uh, meals, then you really want to look for a microwave meal that has you know, vegetables mixed in with the pasta, all of those are healthy to, to eat. And in fact, the heat generated by a microwave, even though it does break down some vitamins like vitamin C, because the cooking time is a lot lower, um, you actually break down less uh, water soluble vitamins than you do, for example, if you were to boil a veggie. So they are safe in terms of micronutrient content, but be careful again about some of your choices in terms of the sodium content. Because sodium, if you're someone with, you know, uh, who's supposed to restrict their diet because of edema with sodium in them, some, some of those microwave meals might have that percent DV that's too high in sodium, and that wouldn't be the choice that you should choose of those types. But otherwise, um, those would be uh, safe to eat. If they have vegetables in them, that's great. Uh, make sure you mix it up after you microwave it because microwaves cause hot spots and you you can easily burn your mouth if you don't mix it together um, really well. Good to know, good to know. I didn't actually realize that microwaves break down less of those, uh, some of those nutrients like vitamin C than just boiling them. That's good information. And last question to wrap things up. If someone doesn't really like fruits and vegetables, do they still need to eat them when they're often more expensive than cheaper options? I know. So I always start that conversation about like, are there any ones that you do like? Like, do you like the sweeter version? Some veggies are sweeter, like carrots or potatoes. Um, some people complain that they don't like fruits and vegetables because they make them feel gassy. So I talked to them about the FODMAP content of some of those vegetables and suggest they try lower FODMAP veggies like bananas or blueberries or cantaloupe or things like, yeah, you know, the carrots or bok choy, cucumbers are pretty low in FODMAP as well. So I think some of the part of the discussion needs to be about like the why um, they don't like it. Some people say it makes them gassy. They're not used to the fiber content or the FODMAP content. And so giving advice about that. And then others are maybe they don't like um, fruits and veggies, veggies that are too sweet or they don't like it. Some veggies, if they're a little bit older, can taste a little bit bitter. So I, I like to ask about the why of that. And then I give advice about it. I mentioned the shake idea. You can make a variety of different shakes um, with yogurt, if you like yogurt, and mix those together so you can get a blast of that food group, but without it being in the typical form. Or you can even make it in fun foods, such as some muffins. Like there are some carrot muffins or banana muffins made with a yogurt base that actually can be really, really healthy. You could make it oh, the sherbet um, in the summer. If, if say, um, you don't like a lot of fruits and you're worried they're expensive, you can, mi you can mix that with crushed ice or or, or again, you can make um, take yogurt and blend it all together. So I think a lot of that, we do need to eat it. They are more expensive, but I think we can be creative about the way we eat them. Uh, it doesn't have to be the traditional, it's on my plate as a separate food item and I don't like the look of that or I don't want to eat that. I can, you can mix it with other foods that you do like to give yourself that blast of that food group. And so 
I, I think it is definitely more expensive, but I think you can save on the expense by bu buying in bulk when it's in season, by, by freezing it. A lot of people do like dried fruits, for example, because they like sweeter things and they can make their own or they could try that way. Like I told you before, you know, you can, you can think about, um, putting it in the oven, putting a little bit of oil on it to make it taste a little bit better um, and look for different creative ways to, to get that. But a lot of people will, will like to drink shakes in the morning. Some people don't like the look of the way little kids often don't like green veggies or whatever and would inform me in clinic, I don't eat vegetables, but they eat potatoes, they eat carrots, they, I just don't tell them the veggies. Right. And so I focus on what do you like about them and what tastes yummy about them and try to add things dips. A lot of people, as you mentioned in the previous questions, maybe you'll eat carrots or celery or whatever if you dip it in something like yogurt. That could be fun. Um, and so I think being creative of how you offer them is really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I know that we're about at time. I see one question in the chat uh why why was milk replaced by water in the canada's food guide cost sensitivities antibiotics diana i don't know if you want to answer that one <laughs> i don't think i i can answer the part about the antibiotic part of things but i think a lot of that was concern about uh saturated fat intake uh in the diet with with consuming higher uh, saturated fat or whole milk products. Also, the overall obesity epidemic in North America, the, uh, drinking your calories, whether it's fruit juice or in, in milk was a concern to the reviewers. And so they really wanted to promote the consumption of water and, and in a sense to avoid liquid calorie consumption because it's easier to consume way more uh, energy than you need in liquid form. I don't really think that I'm the best person to comment on antibiotics um, because I know that there it is possible to get milk without the cow being exposed to that too. But I think somebody else should answer that. Does that help? I think so. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the antibiotic uh, side of things with milk, but I know that uh, promoting water is never a bad thing. And you know, if, if milk is a choice that you want to, you know, have for a protein source, if you're using a low fat milk source, and that can be, you know, a good way to get some extra protein in sometimes, but having enough water in the day is really great for hydration and just, yeah, like Diana said, not, not drinking your calories. And plant-based beverage, vitamin D and calcium fortified plant-based beverages are a good option in order to meet oh. your needs. I think there is some controversy in pediatrics, which I won't talk too much about because I'm a pediatric dietitian, about that Canadian children should be drinking plant-based, like a, a calcium or vitamin D fortified beverage with their meals in order to meet their vitamin D and calcium needs because vitamin D, less than 20% of Canadians meet their needs. And um, for children need vitamin D for optimal growth and development of their bones. So I think that that conversation in pediatrics in kids under the age of, of you know, pre-puberty, that's a really important conversation. But for adults, if you are post-puberty and you've already, you know, you've already met your full height, then really the promotion of water is, is really to avoid excess consumption of calories and saturated fat. And you can choose other plant-based beverages is an option. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't see any more questions, but with that, I will wrap this session up. I'd like to take the time to thank our speaker, Dr. Major, today for her great presentation. As I mentioned, the session will be available on the CLF webpage, our resource hub, uh, Facebook and YouTube channels over the next few days. The CLF is also returning to more free in-person events in select regions. We are having our Live Right Health Forums coming up in three locations towards the end of April and early May. So if you are in Vancouver, Calgary, or Ottawa areas and you'd like to attend, please register at liver.ca slash forum24.
Additionally, keep an eye out for our upcoming Live Right sessions throughout the year. Our next webinar session is April 25th, which will focus on navigating the healthcare system in Canada. For more information on these sessions, you can go to liver.ca slash webinars, and more information will be available at the start of each month. So if you don't see the sessions posted yet, or there's minimal information, please do check again in a few weeks as we are likely finalizing some of these details. Uh, before we conclude, I do want to mention that there will be a post-session survey slash evaluation available at the end of the session to anyone who's registered, and we will be sending that link out shortly after the webinar to complete, and we do appreciate when people are able to complete that. So you can stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, X, which was formerly Twitter, uh, or even visit us at liver.ca. Thank you all for attending today's Live Right session on nutrition on a budget. And should you have any additional questions or comments, or simply want to stay up to date on anything liver health related, you can connect with us, as I mentioned, on social media, or uh, through my email at adjetliver.ca, or send us an email at clf at liver.ca. Thank you again, and have a great evening. Thank you.